Uh, today's message is quite long, it's quite complicated. Uh, so in preparing for today's message, I uh, got some ideas from my IDG. I call it crowdsourcing for ideas for the sermon. So anyway, if today if I say anything that doesn't make sense, you can blame the IDG. Uh, if not, then it's, it's wrong. Okay, we'll just, just keep going. Okay, let's pray before we start. God, we pray that today as we read your word, you speak to us. God, we pray that you believe us. Uh, reveal yourself to us. And God, we pray that as we see your glory, you help us to worship you. Uh, make us obey you more. God, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I invited today's sermon, what does God look like? Uh, and the question would be, if you met God now, uh, what do you think you would see? Um, maybe what, from what we see in movies, sometimes we think of God as uh, if we encounter God, we think of a bright light. Or maybe we think of him as a wise old man. Uh, maybe that's what some some uh, artists have drawn. You know, if you watch movies, maybe God looks like Morgan Freeman. Um, and when I was preparing today's passage, I was just thinking about this: What does God look like? What would I see if I see God? And hopefully as we read the passage today, we can get some idea or we can get closer to this answer uh, as we look through the passage together. Before we begin, uh, let's do a recap of what we learned last week. Okay, so uh, last week we learned about the golden calf, uh, Elder Greg preached to us. Okay, we learned about how uh, the Israelites had left Egypt. Okay, they had uh, been liberated from the Egyptians by God. Okay, and they were in the wilderness now. Moses had gone on Mount Sinai to receive the word from God, okay, to receive the law, uh, the Ten Commandments from God. Uh, and during this time, the Israelites were at the foot of the mountain, and they uh, were disobeying God. Right? They asked Aaron to build for them a golden calf so that they may worship it. Uh, and they indulged in sexual promiscuity, uh, and they disobeyed God. Right? Idolatry. So when Moses came down, he was very angry. He threw the tablets of stone on the, on the ground. They broke. And after that, the Israelites faced the wrath of God where God uh, sent them a plague. And also the Levites had to go through the camp and kill all those who, uh, who were disobedient towards God. Okay, so this is a low point. Okay, if you think about this, this is a low point in Israel's history. Okay? Um, and what is going to happen after this? What is going to happen next? Now that God has been angered by the Israelites and the Ten Commandments have been destroyed also because Moses threw it on the ground. What is going to happen next? And that is where we will begin today. If you look at your outline, I have decided today's passage into three portions. And the first one, from verse 1 to 6, uh, I, I've, entitled it, I've entitled it, A Glimpse of Life Without God. Okay, a glimpse of life about God. So if you look at Exodus chapter 33, it starts out with God saying to Moses, Depart, go out from here. Okay, go out of this place and go to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so this sounds like business as usual. It sounds like God is telling Moses to go to the promised land just as he had promised his forefathers. Um, he promises to drive out Okay, so it's a land sword to God, uh, to Moses' forefathers. And he promises to drive out the land's inhabitants. Right? He promises that uh, he will send an angel, he will drive out all these uh, parasites, Hivites, Jebusites, so on and so forth. Okay, he will drive them out. And it will be a land flowing with milk and honey. Right? Which means that the land will be prosperous, it will be fertile, it will be good. So God is telling them to leave this place go to the good land that has been promised to them. Sounds like a good deal, right? Sounds like something good. And it's business as usual. This is something that the Israelites have been hearing for a long time. Since Genesis, all the way until Exodus, okay, this has been promised to them constantly. But is it really a good deal? Right? There's a twist, right? God says now, but I will not go up among you because if I go, I will consume you because you are a stiff-necked people. Now what does it mean to be stiff-necked? 
You know, Linda always says that I am thick neck, but now I am not so thick because I lost some weight. Uh, but what is stiff neck? Stiff neck is not when your wife steal your pillow at night and then you wake up with a stiff neck. It's not that. Right? When we have stiff neck, it really means that we are stubborn. Okay, when, when God describes the Israelites as stiff neck, it means that they are stubborn. Right? They think that they know better than God. When God tells them to do something, they will reject it, they will refuse. Okay? They refuse to submit to God. Okay, as seen by in past examples when God brought them out of Egypt, all right, they are always complaining. They always say that, you know, why, why do you bring us out of Egypt? If, if we come into the wilderness, you just brought us here to die. It would be better if we were in Egypt. You know? So the Israelites always had these kind of things. Right? Just recently, they, they worshipped the golden calf. You know, these are examples of them uh, and their rebellious nature. So this constant rebellion is something that you can see in Israel. And God is saying that because of this constant rebellion, uh, I cannot go with you because I will consume you, I will destroy you. Okay, so a stiff neck is really like, in this picture here, if you can see, um, it's like when you have a sheep or when you have a horse and you want to guide it in a certain way. You know, the master wants to guide it in a certain way, but the horse refuses. You know, it just refuses to go in the right direction, often uh, meaning that it might be going in a dangerous way. Lah. So what can we learn from this? We can learn that God's holiness cannot coexist with Israel's rebellion. Okay, God's holiness cannot coexist with Israel's rebellion. And that is why when he says that he will not go out with them, okay, he will not go out with them because if he does, he says that if you continue this way, I will consume you. Okay, I will have to destroy you. Now, put yourself in the shoes or in the sandals of the Israelites. Last time, no shoes, so they wear sandals. Put yourself in the shoes of the Israelites, okay? How would you react when you hear something like this? Verse 4 says, When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on their ornaments. <coughs> right? So if you heard something like this, it sounds like bad news. God will not go out with us. <coughs> and indeed, that's what the Israelites did, right? They mourned. Now, when we read this, in my IDG, uh, we thought that it's a bit strange. You know, we, we were questioning how come the Israelites were born. You know, I mean, for us, it makes sense. God is not going to go up with them to uh, the promised land. Sounds like bad news, but is it really genuine? You know, are these Israelites genuinely mourning? God had just described them as stiff neck. <coughs> and that means that these are people who often say that, you know, why, why must we follow this God? Why do you bring us out of Egypt? You know? And if that were really the case, do you think their mourning would be genuine? Perhaps for some of them, that might be, it might be the case. But perhaps for the rest of them, it might be slightly different. Uh, we can look at them, okay, we can think about this from uh, this perspective, where perhaps with the same uh, response, the same response of mourning, they might have done it from two different motivations, which I will go through now. The first one is the group who are devoted to God. These people treasure their relationship with God. They might have felt deserted by God. But to them, the physical blessings of the land, or the physical blessings that they will receive even if they enter the promised land, is still not nothing compared to God's presence, right? So these would be the group of Israelites who really treasured their special relationship with God. They know about the promise that uh, God had given to their forefathers. And now that they were out of Egypt, they probably were looking forward to going to the promised land. You know? But when God says that I will not go out with you, then this was something that really to them sounds like a disastrous word. So this will be the first group of people. To them, no matter what you give them, a land flow in milk and honey, even if you give them protection, you give them the land uh, perfectly. Right? To them, all this is nothing if God is not going to go with them. This will be the first group of people. This will be the ideal group of people. But how about the next group? The next group, I call them the doubtful. Okay, it's like more doubtful. Why? Perhaps these guys will treasure the benefits of God's presence. So God being with them, is undoubtedly a good thing, right? If God is with you, He 
was the one who created the ten plagues. He was the one who split the Red Sea. You know? And now that the God says that he is not going to go with them, these guys will feel a bit desperate. If they look at themselves, they will say, hey, you know, we are a new nation. We just left Egypt. We only have women, children, and farmers. You know, we don't know how to fight. We have no army. We have no weapons. We have no economy. We don't even have a land of our own. How are we going to survive without God? To them, really, God's means or God's presence is a means to an end. When God is with them, they will see, oh, okay, they will feel assured. They won't feel so scared. But without God, it might sound like a disastrous word. They might not survive. Even though God promises them uh, entrance or passage, safe passage into the land, maybe they don't even trust God to do that without Him and without His presence. Which brings us to our first truth for life. Okay, our earthly success and our comforts count for nothing without the presence of God in our lives. This is something that I think we can glean from the response, ideally, of the first group of people, the devoted, who when they see God's, uh, when they see that God has taken His presence out of them, that He will not go in them into the land, then they find this a disastrous way. And for us, I think this is something we can learn ourselves, right? Consider this. Are we truly devoted to God? Or are we also stiff-necked? When we, when we think about ourselves, right, really, who are we really like? Perhaps you would like to be like the first group of people who see God's presence as uh, a reflection of our special relationship with God. But more often than not, are we not more like the stiff-necked people who think that we know better, who think that we don't want to bend our will to God, we instead insist on doing what we think we should be doing, and we do what we want to do in the way that we want to do it. Second thing that we can consider is our relationship with God a transactional one. This is one, this is something that we can learn perhaps from the second group of people, uh, where to them God's presence in their lives was a means to an end. And how do we know that we are we have a transactional relationship with God? When we obey Him, we think, or when we pray to Him, we hope that in doing so, He will be good to us. Sometimes it's all very subconscious. But if we think hard about it, maybe we might realize that really we treat our relationship with God as a transactional one. Can you see? Okay. Sometimes we ask questions like, God, I've been serving you faithfully in church. Why did you give me this terrible illness? If we ask God these kind of questions, perhaps that might show that we have this transactional perspective towards our relationship with God. Another question can be when we say, God, I have given my life to you. Why is my work still so hard? Why do I still struggle so much in my workplace? Or why do I have so many failed relationships? Sometimes we also ask, God, I have been giving offering to you, but why do you take my job away? You know, when we ask questions like this, it suggests that you know, we see our obedience to God as a reason for God to give us certain physical blessings or certain good things in this life. And we expect that from God. We see it as a transaction. But if that were the case, then we need to reconsider our relationship with God and to think about how we can make it one that is not transactional, but one that is genuine and truly devoted to God. One that is a real relationship of devotion. And if that were the case, if we were to think about that, then what would a life of true devotion look like? That brings us to our second portion. A glimpse of a life devoted to God. Right, this is going to be from verse 7 to chapter 34, verse 4. He says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Okay, this is uh, what we learn about Moses. So as we move on to the next portion of this passage, we actually see a bit of an advertisement. Okay, there's a bit of a break in the narrative. We learn about how Moses, all this time, had the practice of going out into this thing called a tent of meeting to meet with God. Right? The tent of meeting. 
Now this is not the tabernacle that we have learned about previously. The tabernacle has not been built yet. It will be built in the next chapter or so. Right? So this is the tent. But this is the tent of meeting. And in this tent of meeting, we learn two things. We learn that God would, eh, we learn that Moses would often go out into this tent of meeting outside of the camp to meet with God. And he will meet with God on behalf of the people. Right? He will bring their concerns to God. He will speak with God. And how is his relationship described? Exactly as we read just now, that he will speak with God uh, as a friend. Right, so this is Moses' special relationship with God. Unlike probably anybody else in uh, history, something that Moses would do. And so understanding this, we can look at Moses' special relationship with God in the following verses after this. How can, what can we learn about Moses? We can learn that Moses, being a friend of God, right, with this very good relationship that he had with God, he allowed him to be very direct, very bold, and very honest with God. You can look at verse 12, verse 13, verse 15, verse 16, verse 18. These are all examples of Moses directly approaching God with a, with a request, uh, asking God for whatever you can see in this passage. Right? He would ask God, for example, in verse 15 and 16. Okay, you see that he's in sync with God with his request. For example, in verse 13, he would ask God to show him his ways. Right? Directly, he would just ask God, show me your ways. Why? Show me your ways so that I can find favour in your sight. So that he may know you and find favour in his sight. Right? This is what he would ask God. What else would he do? He would ask God's presence to be with them. In verse 15 and 16. He will ask that God's presence go with them so that it may be known uh, to all the other nations that they are a favored nation. Right, so Moses is very direct, very honest, and he tells God, God, please do this for us so that the other nations may see this. And Moses does this not for his own selfish reasons, but because he is aligned with God and he knows that when the other nations see that Israel is successful as a nation, it is not because of their own might, but it's because of what God has done for them. That is why he wants God's presence to go with them. Lastly, in verse 18, he asked God to show him his glory. And for us, perhaps in an Asian culture, we, we might always think of something like this as uh, very audacious, very ta -ta. You know, like um, when you watch those Chinese movies and we see the subjects go to the emperor, you know, we think that, well, how can a subject talk to an emperor like this? Likewise, how can a small human speak to God like this? How can a small human ask God, you know, show me your glory? But really, on the other, on the flip side, how we can look at this is, this really shows Moses' desire to see God. This really shows Moses' desire to see God's glory, to see God as God really is, so that he may worship God. Right, and later when we see in chapter 34, verse 8, that is exactly what he does when he finally sees God's glory. Right? So these are all glimpses of a life that is devoted to God. When we look at this short little passage, we can see a glimpse of what Moses' life is like. And more than just these two things, what else can we see? In chapter 34, verse 1 to 4, we see the obedience that Moses displays. God said, okay, previously you destroyed the two tablets of stone, Never mind, now you go and make another two talents. Right? Next day, come, wake up early. Next day, wake up early, bring it up to the mountain, and there I will meet you again. And if you read chapter 34, verse 1 to 4, it sounds like a very short period of time. And when I was reading this, it just made me wonder, like, um, how big are the tablets? And how long it will take for Moses to make these tablets of stone? You know, last time, it's not like they had advanced tools or anything like that. So the, the fact that Moses can do this overnight, no questions asked. You know, that reflects, that shows something of his obedience to God, of his attitude towards God. Lastly, the thing that we can also see from this life of Moses, a life of devotion, is his love for other people. Right? Constantly throughout this passage, at the start of the conversation with God, chapter 33, verse 12, he brings up uh, Israel, right? Because God had already said that now I'm not going to go out with you. But he says, bring up these people. That's how he starts his conversation, this concern for uh, 
Israel. As he continues the conversation in verse 13, he reminds God that this nation, remember, this nation is your people. Constantly talking about it. When God says that he has favor uh, for Moses, Moses extends the favor to Israel. He says, I am your people. When you have favor on me, I am your people. And lastly, when God reveals himself to Moses on the mountain, as he worships God, he also again asks God. This is in chapter 34. Chapter 34, verse 9. He again asks God to pardon uh, the iniquity of the people uh, and to bring to follow them up into the land. So you can see that the people are always on Moses' mind. Constantly, constantly. He's always asking them. He's always asking God about the people. Always reminding God about the people. He's always uh, praying and interceding for the people. And this brings us to our next truth for life, right? When we are connected with God, as Moses was, we will boldly seek Him and the good of others. Okay? When we are connected with God, we will boldly seek Him and the good of others. So in the first section, we look briefly at a life without God. Okay, how that will be disastrous. We didn't actually see what life uh, is, but we see what it can be. Without God, how it will be disastrous, how it is nothing compared to a life of physical comforts. In this section, we see someone, an example of someone who had found favor in God's eyes, and we have a great example uh, that we can learn from. Okay, so for us to consider, okay, what are our concerns? What do we pray for? Okay. Are we asking, are we always only asking God for things within our, our immediate field of vision? Now, immediate concerns. Is there anything wrong with that? Definitely not. Right? We're supposed to go to God with our, our concerns. Um, but do we see the bigger picture? Do we see God's kingdom? Or do we consider the things that God wants? Or are we only praying for the things that we want, the things that we need? Do we boldly approach God honestly with our concerns and ask that His will be done in our lives? Or are we only asking Him with our wants and our wishes? Okay. How about the people around us? How are we loving to the people around us? Right, if Moses constantly had this uh, care and concern, you know, they were always on his mind, the lives and the, 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 the faith of the Israelites were always on Moses' mind and he was always bringing these concerns up to God. Okay? Can we also learn from this? Sometimes when, we, when we, we don't even need to look very far, sometimes when we look at the people around us, we find that the hardest people to love maybe are our colleagues, our friends, our siblings, our family. And we don't love them as much as we should. You know, I know that for myself, I don't pray for Linda as much as I should. Uh, I don't love her uh, as much as I should. I don't love her the way that Christ loved the church. You know? and this, these are areas that I can grow. And Linda also, uh, on her part, she always said that I have a thick neck. So, it's not very loving of her. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, so think about this. Think about how we can learn and care for our brothers and sisters in church. You know, what more can we do? Um, there are a lot of people around us in church, in, in, our, in the community that we live in, that uh, need our love, need our care, need our concern, need our attention. And uh, I think as a community of believers, very often, sometimes we are very comfortable within our own circles. We are very comfortable where we are and we don't want to really step up go out of our comfort zone, go beyond, reach out, and care for others. It takes effort, but when we are connected with God, this is something that will be on our hearts. The last thing that we can learn from this section, that we can consider, is how eager are we to learn God's ways, to see God's glory. So Moses went straight to God and said, show me your glory. You know, I want to see your ways, show me your ways. Uh, do we have this attitude as well? Are we as eager as Moses. You know, to Moses, seeing God's glory, seeing God's ways uh, is his priority. It was probably the highlight of his day, his week, 
His month, his year, his life. So that was his highlight. And can we say the same thing about ourselves when we come to see God, when we learn about God? If I'm honest with myself, uh, am I more eager to come to church and preach, uh, to learn God's word, or am I more eager to go for football after church? Well, obviously, the truth is uh, I'm more eager to come to church and preach. I will give up all my afternoons of football for uh, more preachings uh, in church. No, just kidding. <laughs> But seriously, do we desire to see God's glory? In the first place, but in the first place, the question is how can we even see God's glory, right? Can we even see God's glory? Uh, just as Moses asked. Moses can ask this, can we also ask it? Can we see God's glory? Okay. And that brings us to the last section. A glimpse of God's glory. So in the previous section. Moses brought a number of requests before God. Okay, in chapter 33, verse 18, he asked to see God's glory. And uh, in chapter 33, verse 13, he also asked God to show him his ways. And now in the last portion, we will see God's response to Moses. And perhaps this might shed more light for us, uh, or for us, what it means to see God's glory. Okay, we see, we read that the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord. God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So this happens in uh, chapter 34, verse 5 to 7. Finally, God descends in a cloud, okay, and he passed before Moses just as he said he would at the end of chapter 33. Right, what did he do? First, he proclaimed his name, uh, the Lord, the Lord, which uh, was Yahweh. Right, he would proclaim this. What else did he do? He declared his character to Moses. So God essentially gave Moses like a summary of who God is. Okay, a quick summary, a condensed summary of who God is. These are all the different attributes of God that he declared to Moses. He said that he is a merciful and gracious God. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He keeps steadfast love for thousands. He forgives iniquity. He punishes the guilty. So when Moses asks God to show him his glory, how does God respond? God responds by meeting Moses, and on meeting Moses, right, being before Moses, what does he do? He proclaims his name, and he declares his character. And one thing that we can learn from this is that God's glory, really, God's glory is really seen in him, and his, in his character, in his ways, okay, presenting himself. Uh, sometimes when we talk about the word glory, uh, it can be an abstract concept. You know, it's hard for us to understand what, what, what is God's glory? What does it really mean to see God's glory? Sometimes we think of glory as splendor, as majesty. Uh, but something that I have found helpful uh, to learn in the past, someone shared this with me, that when we say God's glory, we really mean the essence of God's presence. Uh, which might sound a bit complicated. It means that where God is present, okay, when you see God's glory, where God is present, you will also see his essence. Okay? Uh, what does this mean? It is like when we say uh, God is God is omnipresent. Okay, God is everywhere. But when we see his glory, we will really see the essence of him being there. His goodness. We will see his goodness. Okay? But if uh, all this is too chim, don't worry, don't think about it. Because the passage basically from this passage we can see that God's glory is when we see his character. Okay, when we see who he is. What this means is that God's law, okay, God's law also reveals his character. That is why after he declares who he is, after he declares his character, he goes on to give Moses the Ten Commandments again. He gives Moses the Ten Commandments, first of all, because this is uh, God renewing his covenant with Israel. But at the same time, in revealing God's character, uh, rather in revealing the law to Moses again, God is again revealing his character. For example, when God talks about how Moses is uh, supposed to tell the Israelites, you know, that they are not supposed to worship other gods, when they're not supposed to make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, how they are not supposed to do this because God is a jealous God. What does this reveal to us about God? You know, God's uh, hatred for idolatry, what does this show about God? This shows that God is truly the true God. He's the one true God. That is why he hates idolatry. When God talks about the Exodus, 
you know, when we read all these um, laws, which to us might sound a bit complicated and a bit confusing, when it says, you know, remember uh, the Passover from in the month of Abi. Okay, when it says that, uh, what does it say? Verse 18 and 20. When it says that you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. So unleavened bread reminds them of their time in Egypt when they had to uh, leave Egypt. Right, when to right, remind them of the Exodus. Or when he talks about the firstborn, the firstborn being uh, consecrated to God. What does this show? This show this all reminds them of the time of the Exodus. And if that is what he's talking about, if that is supposed to come to the mind of the Israelites, then this law is supposed to reveal to the Israelites that God is a redeemer God. Right? This is the same God who brought them out of Egypt. How about the law of the Sabbath? You know, when God says that you know y'all must keep the Sabbath, keep the feast of uh, first first fruits. Right? All this shows that it reminds them that this is a God who, first of all, deserves their worship. You know, set aside the Sabbath for the worship of God. And at the same time, you can trust in this God to provide for you. This will be the God who will provide you your crop. He will provide you your land. He will extend your borders. He will enlarge your land. Uh, and this is what this law shows. You also, when we read the law like this, what can, we, what can we learn about it from God? Sometimes when we read the Old Testament, we find it very hard to understand. We find it very dry. But really, when we think about it, the laws that we study, the laws of the Old Testament, however dry and however technical they may be, actually are all revealing God's character. They're all revealing God's character. And when they are revealing God's character, that also means that they are really showing us God's glory. That is how we can see God's glory in the Old Testament. And the evidence of this, right, what is the result of this? What is the result of Moses uh, coming into contact with God, seeing God's glory? The evidence of Moses having seen God's glory when he comes down to the Israelites is that now his face reflected the glory of God. Right? Which is uh, maybe a, a hard passage to read. When we, when we read a passage like this, it's a bit confusing. What does it mean that Moses' face was shining? What does it actually look like? Uh, to give you an idea, last night I tried to uh, shave my head again so that it looks a bit shiny. Okay, so that you get an idea of what a shining face might look like. No, just kidding. Right, so Moses' face was shining not because he was on the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. He never would, never bathed, never washed himself. Then his face is full of oil. It's not like that. Okay. Rather, verse 29 states that just that because God, Moses had been talking to God, that is why his face started to shine. And we can understand a bit, this a bit more, right? When we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, okay, if you turn to your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, that talks about this episode uh, in greater detail. And we can learn more about this whole aspect or this whole episode of Moses' shining face uh, from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 7, okay, explains further stating that Moses' face shone as a reflection of the glory of the old uh, covenant. Okay? So if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, let me bring this back a bit. When we look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, okay, one thing that we can learn is that the glory of the old covenant surpasses the glory of the new covenant surpasses that of the old covenant. Okay, that is the gist of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But what is this old covenant? What is this new covenant? Let's talk about the old covenant. Right? The old covenant is that of the law that of what Moses had received from God. Now, for all his good things, for all his devotion to God, we still learn that Moses is inadequate. Okay, this is uh, a flaw of the whole covenant. Okay? Moses could not see God's face because if he sees God's face, he will die. Okay? In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 and 9, we learn that the old covenant is described as a ministry of death and condemnation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, we learn that the old covenant, with the old covenant, a veil remains over the hearts of those who read it. What does all this mean? Why is it a ministry of death? Why is it a ministry of condemnation? Because if you read um, 
if you read the passage that we have today, Exodus chapter 33, you see that even after the Israelites had sinned, right, they, they worship the golden calf, they constantly are stiff-necked. Even after they do this, what can God do? <coughs> even after doing all these things, God still gives them the law again. That's all God can do. Or rather, that's all God did. God forgave them, forgave their sins, pardon their iniquity, but in the end, He still gave them this old covenant, this law, that will not make them any better. You know, it's like, uh, imagine you have a, a child who does something wrong. You know, uh, your child breaks your rules, your, breaks your rules at home. You tell your child, okay, don't throw your food on the floor, but the child throws the food on the floor. After you punish the child, after you forgive the child, what can you do after that? You give the child the rule again. This is really just a ministry of death and condemnation. Because with the law that they are receiving, it is not going to make them any better. The law is there simply to point out that these are your faults, these are your sins, and this is how you are going to offend God. This is the standard that you can never reach. This is the standard to show you that you cannot make it. So with regards to that, the Old Covenant is really one of a ministry of death and condemnation. But when we read, when we read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, right, it says that when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. So with the New Covenant, okay, we look at John chapter 1 verse 18. For Moses, Moses could not see the face of God. But when we see Jesus, Jesus is so far, so far beyond Moses so far surpassing Moses. Moses cannot see the face of God. Jesus sees God and Jesus makes God known. Right? The Old Covenant is a ministry of death and condemnation, but for the New Covenant, in 2 Corinthians, it tells us that it's a ministry of the Spirit and of righteousness. What does this mean? The Old Covenant was simply the law coming to them, telling them that they cannot make it. But with the New Covenant, with Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit, we can become better. We can start to obey God. We can start to love God. The New Covenant is one that changes us. The Old Covenant tells us what is wrong. The New Covenant changes us and it makes us right before God. And lastly, as you read just now, with Jesus, we remove the veil. Right? The veil is removed. What does that mean? What does it mean when we say that Jesus removes the veil? When we see, when we, when we talk about seeing God's glory, right? Uh, how really can we see God's glory? We, we look at the Old Testament and we see uh, the law, we see God's character. But now in the New Covenant, with the New Testament, uh, if we ask, at the start of today's message, I said, if you could imagine what it would be like to see God, what would you see? And John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us really that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory, uh, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus, we can see the glory of God because we have Jesus. Right? We can see God in all His glory in the person of Jesus. And I say that uh, glory is the essence of God's presence. Right? What is the characteristic in Jesus that really encapsulates everything uh, that is the glory of God? That is grace and truth. Right, that, is, that is who Jesus is and that is the glory uh, that we can see. <coughs> so God's glory, uh, I, start, I ask at the start of the sermon, what would you see when you see God? What do you think you might see? Uh, I think what we will really see, okay, that will really reveal God's glory, is a bloody man uh, hung on a cross. Uh, on the cross there is where God's uncompromising justice met his boundless grace and that is where we can see God's glory right so earlier in the example when I said all those things uh, that we can learn from Moses you know Moses uh, sought God Moses loved the people Moses was bold and direct to God all these things that we learn about Moses and all these things that we can learn to be like Moses uh, you can cancel out Moses name and you can replace it with Jesus name because Jesus is a far better example for us to learn from right that's what we have with the new covenant and when Jesus removes the veil, it means that now, when we look at the whole Bible, whether it's from Old Testament to New Testament, okay, with Jesus in our lives, we 
we can really start to see God as God really is, we can start to see His glory, we can start to see His character. Which brings us to the last truth of life. Okay. God graciously transforms us when we humbly encounter Him in His Word. Right. Moses met God on the mountain and his face shone when he came down. Uh, that was a reflection of the glory that he had witnessed. Um, and that is a physical uh, reflection of him being transformed by encountering God. Humbly. Right? When he sees God, what is his response? His response is worship. Right? He bows down and worship. So when he humbly encounters God, he is transformed. Likewise for us, when we humbly encounter God in His Word, when we see God's glory as He really is, when we see God's character, we see God's attributes, we know God and we see Him in His Word, we too will be transformed uh, when we are humble, we humble ourselves and we, we let the Spirit change us. Right? We ask ourselves, how come Moses can be like that? How come Moses can be so devoted to God? Just consider the amount of time that Moses has spent with God. Right? 40 days and 40 nights just with God on the mountain. The first time round when he received the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. After he destroyed the uh, tablets again, another 40 days and 40 nights on the mountain in this episode. Right? 80 days and 80 nights. Uh, yeah. 80 days and 80 nights just in this example alone. This is just over these three days. But over the whole course of his life, the amount of time that Moses spent with God is a reason why Moses is so devoted to God. And if you want to be like that, right? If you want to have this life of devotion, then we too need to read God's word. And in reading God's word, we too can see his glory. So two things to consider from this last portion. The first is that have we turned to the Lord? Okay, we have the new covenant, we have Jesus, uh, we have a hope. Okay, we don't need to look at the law and try to fulfill it. We don't need the old covenant that tells us that we cannot make it. Uh, that it's just a ministry of condemnation. We have the new covenant. We have Jesus with us. Uh, and we have the Spirit. Okay? So for those of us here, who maybe we, we still live our, our lives stiff-necked, rebellion, uh, refusing to bow to God, refusing to submit to God, seeking after our own kingdom, our own uh, goals, our own objectives in life, ignoring God, disregarding God, have we turned to God? In this case, Moses interceded for the people, but for us, we have Jesus who will intercede for us. Okay, turn your life and give it to Jesus. Lastly, how much time have you given to knowing God through His Word? Joining the IG, reading the Bible on your own, joining BSF, uh, reading online devotional materials, buying books when they are available, uh, studying the Bible on your own, praying to God on your own. You know, how much time have we given to it? When we do, when we find that we start to give more time to God, then really it will be like 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, where we all with unveiled face, finally, we see God for who He truly is, and we are transformed uh, from one image, okay, a, a bad image of God, a poor image of God, to one that really brings him glory. So read God's word, know him, uh, turn to him, and see that God is truly our only hope uh, in this life. Uh, that knowing God, right, God's presence in our life, is just so far better than anything this world can offer. Okay, with that, uh, let us close and uh, let me pray for all of us. Dear God, we thank you for this reminder from your word. Lord, thank you for reminding us about how we are always inclined to rebel against you. We are stiff-necked, just like uh, the Israelites in this uh, episode. And God, I pray that you help us to humble ourselves, to repent. And God, I pray that you reveal to us uh, yourself through your word. And God, I pray that as we see your glory, uh, we see the glorious things that you have done. We see how you are really a great God that deserves our worship. That having you in our lives is so much better than anything we can ever uh, experience on this earth. God, I pray that uh, that will cause us to turn to you. And God, that will transform us to be more like you. So that we can glorify you uh, to those around us. 
God pray for all of us as we continue to reflect on today's message, as we think about this passage, uh, as we think about uh, what 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says also. But I pray that you help us to really see that we are really very privileged uh, to have Jesus, to unveil our hearts that we may see you for who you truly are. God, I pray that uh, all this will result in uh, a life of worship and devotion uh, and obedience to you. So God, I, I thank you for this time. I thank you for uh, opening up your word to us. And God, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit continue to work in us uh, throughout all this time. We ask all this in Jesus' name.